Services, which includes service, and our brother Imad Khan will speak on that in just a minute. Um, I did want to introduce um, our team that has been working on this. Um, this is our first program um, with this initiative. Um, part of that team is um, Sheikh Zaid Khan, who is our Sheikh of our, uh, our Alexa Community Center. Um, there is um, Brother Zulfiqar Khan, who is the president of Alexa Community Center. Uh, Brother Alamin Falak, uh, who is our head of security. Uh, Brother Charles Muhammad, who is a facilitator tonight. Uh, Sister Felicia Bans, um, who is actually a new member of the community, but wanted to be a, you know, in a part of this initiative, alhamdulillah. Uh, Sister Rumaysa Khan, who is um, one of the organizers of the um, Sisters Halaka at the at Alexa Community Center. Uh, Brother Omar Fatah, who is also on our board. Um, Brother Imad Khan, who is one of the organizers of the Boys Halaka at Alexa. Um, Brother Amar Khan, who is another organizer of the Boys Halaka, and Sharik Arain, who is another member of the um, Halaka. So this is our team. We've been working on getting everyone together to start with this educational session and then move on to some service projects, which Imad will be talking about. If we can start now with um, uh, Sheikh Said, and if you can do a dua. Um, welcome everybody uh, to uh, the program and uh, Jazakallah to Sister Hind and Brother Charles specifically for giving us their time and knowledge uh, so that we can better ourselves. Uh, the purpose of all of this is not to just participate in what uh, CIOGC is sponsoring, but also to um, put into practice what we had said uh, in our statement uh, that we had put out in the wake of uh, George Floyd's murder. Uh, we had mentioned in our masjid statement that one of the ways to help dismantle systemic racism and oppression is to first educate ourselves and to educate our own. And hopefully this is one of the first of many steps, inshallah, that we will all be able to take uh, in order to know better, learn better, uh, so that we can do better. And uh, I turn it over to uh, Imad Khan, who will um, now um, introduce the speakers. Imad, can you put your camera on? Uh, Assalamu alaikum, I'm Imad Khan, one of the organizers of the Boys Halaka at Aqsa Community Center. Tonight's educational event is part of a service learning initiative for our youth that will also include donating to toiletry kits to a local homeless shelter and sponsoring and hosting a mobile food pantry at our site on July 29th. If you'd like to support these efforts, please go to our website at aqsaplainfieldmajid.com uh, and donate for either or both of these service projects. You will find them on the homepage. This initiative is part of a CIOGC social justice project challenge. These efforts are not only made to prepare our youth for the future, but also to improve our community's understanding and awareness of racial and social inequities, especially during this critical time for our country. We hope it will establish their intentions and create the impact we wish to have on the greater American societies, American Muslims. Tonight, our facilitators for this discussion are Sister Hind Maki and Imam Charles Muhammad. Sister Hind Maki is an interfaith and anti-racism educator who holds a degree in international relations from Brown University. So, uh, Sister Hind is the founder of Side Entrance, an award-winning we uh, website documenting women's prayer experiences and mosques. She was an advisor to the ISPU project Reimagining Muslim Spaces uh, and consulting with American mosques on gender, economic, and con convert diversity. In 2018, Hind was featured as one of CNN's 25 influential American Muslims. Locally, uh, Sister Hen serves on the advisory boards for Brother Jeffrey Gross, the FSC Institute for Dialogue, Justice, and Social Action at Lewis University, and the Chicago History Museum's exhibit regarding Muslim Americans. Imam Charles Muhammad is a civil engineer and science teacher. For many years, he, he has served as a community activist and an ambassador for improved relations within the Muslim community. Brother Charles is a member of uh, Al-Aqsa Community Center, and he currently serves on the board for the Council of Islamic Organizations of Greater Chicago. 
Uh, I now pass it over to Sister Hind. Assalamu alaikum, everyone, and uh, thank you so much to the Alexa uh, community for inviting me to co facilitate this really important conversation. Um, inshallah, what we're planning on doing today is to have, uh, you know, essentially a listening session with some prompts and some, inshallah, some really honest discussion, honest conversations about uh, our roles as Muslims, uh, you know, in dealing with the situation that we find ourselves today and how we can positively respond to, uh, si you know, situations of racism, whether they're in our own communities or on the streets outside. Um, and so, inshallah, what we are going to do, Brother Charles and I, uh, are going to be essentially tag teaming the conversation today. Um, and I'm going to try to um, uh, share my, my, my screen. Um, but as I do that, I wanted to ask, actually, if Brother Ahmad, if you can introduce the, um, the, the social justice project that you're doing with the with the CIOGC pr project and to explain what the the program is actually about what you all will be doing this summer so uh, inshallah uh, on July 29th we are hosting a mobile food pantry uh, which involves uh, multiple people from our community and all of you are encouraged to come uh, at our site uh, it's a community center which uh, we bring over a food truck and uh, we have, uh, I'm not sure, boxes or kits to give out to uh, the food insecure families uh, in our community around. Uh, we also wish to um, help out the, uh, the homeless uh, people within our communities and try to uh, assist them and pr uh, promote them as much as they need so we can help them throughout our community. Uh, this is happening over the course of July, and uh, of course, on July 29th is our mobile food pantry. Please come to your desire. Thank you so much. Uh, it's really important, I think, for all of our communities to give back during this time. Um, part of what the program is, actually, is uh, also, and part of what we're doing today, is uh, a concept called service learning. And service learning combines the idea of service, of community service, of giving back to our communities uh, with learning. With, with, and, and what does that actually look like? Well, we're doing it today. We're, we'll be starting to do that today. And so there's this uh, integration, there's this connection between the service that we do outside and how we serve our community and what we ourselves are learning from it. And what Al-Aqsa is doing um, for this particular project is actually having a series or a couple of conversations on race and racism and the identities of the people at the masjid and how the community can be stronger and uh, at the same time also serving. So there's this real uh, relationship between the service. It's not disconnected, the food pantry and uh, working to, to you know, feed the, the hungry in, in your community is absolutely not disconnected from these internal conversations that you're gonna be having between each other and also within your own selves, within your own hearts, inshallah. And so before we actually uh, completely uh, straight up begin, I'm gonna ask people, because we wanted to, um, we had hoped that we could do this um, project uh, or this, this event today in person, but subhanAllah, we still can't do that. We still can't meet in person. But what I always like to do in these kinds of sessions is to ask people to just say hello or salam in a language that they know. So uh, if, you, if you could just take, you know, 10 seconds to type in the chat function um, below, uh, um, you know, to say hello in a language that you know. So I trust that people are, <laughs> are typing up. Um, and uh, often I'll, I'll also ask people to do this um, when, um, you know, in, in other languages. And it's usually a little bit more um, interpersonal <laughs> than this. Um, okay, so what I'm going to do, I think, I don't know, can people see my screen? 
Yes. Yes. Okay. And then somebody somebody raised their hand. Uh, let's see. Was there a question that you had, uh, Barry Kusu? It, it might have been by mistake. No, oh, okay. All right, so um, what, what I'm gonna do now is actually ask Brother Charles to, uh, to take the lead for this next portion and to really just root ourselves again in the uh, in our own Quranic traditions. This is really important. We are connected to each other today through a masjid, through our worship of Allah, and through our religion, our faith as Muslims. And so as Muslims, we know that we uh, want to root ourselves in the Quranic tradition. Um, before, before I fully hand it over to Brother Charles, I wanted to also um, maybe frame the conversation today uh, with this particular um, uh, quote from the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And some of you might be familiar with it, but Anas ibn Malik reported, uh, radiallahu anhu reported, that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, if the final hour comes and you have a palm cutting or a sapling in your hand, and it's possible to plant it before the day of judgment comes, before the hour comes, then you should go ahead and plant it. This is, to me, this is a really um, profound hadith because, you know, 2020 has been such a difficult year for so many people. Um, 2020 has been a year of, of pandemic, of disease, of pain, of protest, of death. Um, and some people might have also benefited from the time at home and the time, you know, to, to self-reflect. But it's been very difficult for a lot of people. And our prophetic teaching, uh, you know, preaches that even if you feel like the world is ending around you, we still have the obligation to, to plant the seed for a better tomorrow, right? And for me, this, this hadith is also very... Um, uplifting. It's a very positive, uh, and 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 it's 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 something that tells us we shouldn't actually feel depressed about the situation. If we feel like things are out of our control, well, then we should do something that's in our control. And what's in our control is to try to make things better, at least in the area around us. So, does anyone have any um, comment or feedback about this particular hadith? Because what we want to do, even though we're uh, online we want to be connected to each other as much as possible so folks um want to ha have you know have a some kind of feedback around this you can write it in the chat box um and without further ado i'm going to hand it over to my co-facilitator uh, imam brother charles muhammad thank you sister hand assalamu alaikum i'd like to begin in Allah's name, the merciful benefactor, the merciful redeemer. Praise be to Allah, Lord, guardian evolver, cherisher and sustainer of all the worlds, most gracious, most compassionate, master and sole judge on the day of judgment. I mean. Also, I'd like to recite our one ayat from the Quran, the Surah Tul Hujarat, also known as the chambers or the inner apartment. O mankind, we created you from a single pair of a male and a female and made you into nations and tribes so that you may know each other, not that you may despise each other. Barely and the most, barely the most honored of you in the sight of Allah is he or she who is the most righteous of you. And Allah has full knowledge and is well acquainted with all things. Sadaqallah wa Allah speaks the truth. I'd like to really welcome everyone who's able to tune in on Zoom and Facebook Live and thank you all for participating in this important event. And I'd like to offer my appreciation to our youth members at Masjid of Plainfield, 
I'll talk about the Al-Aqsa Community Center. They've done an outstanding job putting this together and we have followed their lead and we are grateful for them with their perspective and their contributions. I would like to share a little bit of my experience as an African-American Muslim here in Chicago area. Growing up, I came to be aware of Islam as a adolescent actually. And I was very fortunate that I witnessed a lot of change in terms of the growth and development of Islam in America, right here, starting in Chicago. And um, that was a blessing because if you could imagine 50 years ago, especially the young people I like to read, just to kind of think about a time before you were part of the world, and even when your parents were very young. In terms of Muslims in America, we did not have the ornate edifices that you see today. In terms of the wonderful masajid, the masjids that you see today, the landscape had none of that. There was a time when Muslims essentially were in the closet in America. Many Muslims were not celebrating outwardly when it came to the fasting and the Eid. And I'm going back to now the 60s, 50s and 60s. And then in the 70s, more and more Muslims began to come from abroad to America. But at the same time, there was a big event happening with the indigenous Muslim community in America. Because it was at that time that the, what was called the lost foundation of Islam took a change. Because when the Honorable Elijah Muhammad passed away, his son, Wallace, who we refer to as w, Imam W. D. Muhammad, transitioned us away from that school of thinking into mainstream Islam. And we became known as the world community of Al-Islam in the West. We began to participate fully in the American society starting in 1975. We began voting and our presence was felt throughout not only the Midwest of Chicago, but throughout the country where we had a following, a community of Muslims throughout America and the Western Hemisphere and even overseas. This meant that people witnessed our change and they began to warm up to Islam. They began to accept the infusion of Muslims into all sectors of the society, civic, political, economic, and so forth. So this garnered a lot of respect for Muslims and it provided cover for those who had come from other lands these Muslims began to thrive because the hearts of the American people were so touched by what you may call one of the largest mass kind of conversions in history, especially in the West, in America, because you had tens of thousands of people who came into Islam simultaneously, into mainstream Islam, and also into mainstream society. I'll give you one example and then maybe someone could touch on this later, but we had in the late 70s established an event that we shared with the city of Chicago. And this event was titled the New World Patriotism Day Parade. During that time, the Vietnam War had just ended. And the spirit in America in terms of patriotism was at an all time low because America had been defeated in Vietnam. Not only were, was America defeated, but American troops had to flee, trying to scramble and leap onto helicopters that were taking off. This was a huge embarrassment. The troops were dis disrespected when they came back to America. So at this time, the insight and the leadership of Imam Wadisuddin Muhammad was that he gave an infusion on the 4th of July to have this celebration of patriotism, to give a kind of a rebirth of the spirit of patriotism because nobody was doing the big fireworks back then. 
Nobody was doing anything because it was a very, very low period. Anyway, long story short, something that you all know of and is known around the world. For the first two years, we did that parade down Michigan Avenue along Grand Park. It was a huge success. And we did it in conjunction with the City of Chicago Special Events Department. And the imam told us after the first two years, we should hand it over and let the city of Chicago take it over, which we did. And they continued the parade for the next couple of years on, uh, right out of the city of Chicago uh, offices. And then lo and behold, Jane Byrne, when she was elected as mayor of Chicago, she took that idea of the new World Patriotism Day Parade and she transitioned it into what is now known as the Taste of Chicago because it was on the 4th of July holiday. And that is where the Taste of Chicago started. This is one of many examples of the profound influence of the indigenous Muslim population in America. I'll give you one more caveat that goes with that, or one more addition. Um, years later, about 20 years later, I was blessed to be involved with the Muslim students at Whitney Young High School as part of the uh, Whitney Young High School um, School Council, we had an event where the students, it, it came from the students, it was the students' idea that they wanted to celebrate Eid starting in the 1990s at the school. It was so huge, we felt we fed thousands of people celebrating the Eid al-Fitr in the school. And it was so popular that other clubs, they wanted to do what the Muslim club is doing. We want to have some of our cuisine to celebrate our occasions on our holidays. So when they started wanting to do the same thing, because we had accommodations for thousands of students for eat. It was all the restaurants were donating food and the families were cooking food. It was amazing. So they came up because it would have been too much for all the clubs to duplicate it. Nobody could keep up with what the Muslim students were doing because our thing was huge. So they decided to start what they call the Taste of Whitney Young, which is one day of the year where all the clubs would pre present some of their cuisine. And it was at, on the lead of the Muslim students. I'm giving you just two small examples of how the Islam established in Chicago in America was very much infused by indigenous Muslims that paved the way for other Muslims who came from other societies, other lands, other countries to engage in America and to have tremendous success establishing masjids that are beautiful with some resistance, but very minimal resistance. You're probably having more resistance now than you had back then. So I just wanted to offer those couple of anecdotes about the experience that I've had with Islam being embraced by the American people. I was blessed to be part of the Dawa committee. Back then we called it the Propagation Committee, where we wanted to make Islam a household name throughout Chicago. And we did that by going to institutions. We would have events once a month at least whether it was at the downtown cultural center or different community centers around the city and suburbs. And then we had a campaign. You hear now about removing all these monuments. To us, that was nothing new. Back in the 70s, Imam W.D. Muhammad established what we call the Creed Committee, which stands for the Committee for the Removal of All Images that Attempt to Portray the Mind. We did fantastic work. We went to thousands of churches in America. Right here in Chicago, I went to at least over a hundred or so churches, along with other members of the Propagation Committee to get to know our neighbors. And we would let them know about our message that it was time for them to remove images of the Prophet Jesus, Isa, alayhi salam. And they were very cooperative. They began, at first we kind of encountered some resistance, but we went to the heart of the matter because we felt that that was the origin of racism in terms of people having an image of a prophet that they called God and worshiping that image in a Caucasian form. And that 
was something that we were successful in helping to get many religious institutions to begin to take down those statues and images. You may not have heard of this, but this was something, in fact, it was the Pope in Rome who invited the Imam to come over. Pope John Paul I received that message because the Imam challenged the Pope to, to do the same thing. And Pope John Paul I was very aggressive in really responding. And if you know the history, he was only in office for a few months. Pope John Paul II and Imam W.D. Muhammad became very good friends. So I'm saying that to say that the influence, and this was kind of done quietly. It was not done in an in-your-face manner. It was done in a very cordial, in a very blessed way. So I wanted to share that because sometimes when people start saying about the problems of the relations between African-American Muslims and Muslims who immigrated to America, and, and sometimes we're not well received because we feel that we're invisible. We feel that when we go to a mosque or a masjid that is outside of the inner city, sometimes we don't feel welcome. And we do, we've done so much groundwork when you look at the history in terms of transitioning, they think we're still old school back in the day and with the, uh, that we don't have the understanding of Islam proper. So, there are many, many things that we can talk about and maybe other people can have some additional uh, anecdotes that they might want to share. But I just wanted to say that there's something called pattern recognition. Pattern recognition can be a blessing and it can be a curse. Because sometimes we see each other and right away we see a pattern and we can kind of figure out that certain things fit certain patterns. Well, science, in terms of nomenclature, benefits immensely from that because everything can be really readily put in some, some kind of understanding in terms of how things fit together. But sometimes racially, when people see a certain person of a certain race or ethnic background, they automatically want to identify that person and put them, peg them in a certain category. And we say, as we said back in the 60s, don't believe the hype because we understand that many of our brothers and sisters from other lands, they come to America and the media, African-Americans have been portrayed in such a lesser light for such a long time that people from abroad, they come and they believe that this is all we are, this all we represent is crime and poverty. So those kind of problems, are do exist, but it is not to our identity. So I just wanted to make that point and just kind of remind everyone that since the 70s, Islam has grown tremendously. And I'll end with this one statistic that most of you probably are not aware of. There is a ranking of the states in America, of the United States, um, on Huffington Post. And this ranking ranks all 50 states according to which state is most Muslim. Well, your state, our state, the state of Illinois, ranks as number one Muslim state in America. And I think that the fact that we have the Council of Islamic Organizations of Greater Chicago is a reflection of that because there's so many Muslims who have come together, not only just in Chicago, but throughout the Chicago land and throughout the state of Illinois. And we have a lot of things going on in Illinois. But check it out for yourself. Go to Huffington Post and look up the rankings for the most Muslim states in America. Illinois ranks number one. And you should be proud that you have something to do with it. I am so proud to have seen the inception of the council starting back in the 90s when Imam W.D. Muhammad encouraged us to work together with all Masajid throughout the Chicagoland area. And he commissioned his brother, Jabber Muhammad, to do the same thing. And Jabber was one of the founding members of the Council of Islamic Organizations of Greater Chicago back in 1992. And I'm proud to have been at his side working in conjunction 
with the exception of the CIOGC. So I say all in CIOGC, and that's our hashtag. Hashtag all in CIOGC and hashtag CIOGC service project. Thank you, Sister Hen. Thank you so much for that. I was on the chat and uh, discussing with other people in the chat that I actually did not know that about Taste of Chicago, the history of it. I didn't know, uh, you know, about Whitney Young and the MSA there. And, you know, these are the kinds of stories we want to uh, collect. We want to know, we want to share them among each other. And this is one of the reasons why I'm very excited and happy that this conversation today is actually not only interracial um, within our Muslim community, but also intergenerational. So it's really, really important that we sit down with people from different generations and learn from each other, learn uh, what the history is and learn what the, you know, we're not gonna be able to create a future if we don't actually know on whose shoulders we're standing and what the history has been and the, the labor that existed before us. Um, and I already know that a few people had been commenting, but we have some time actually now for reflection. So if anyone uh, wants to share their thoughts, not just about what you just heard from Brother, uh, uh, Brother Imam Charles, but also just your own experiences, um, you know, living as Muslims, uh, especially particularly here, I think I would love to hear from some of our uh, elders. Uh, I don't know if, uh, if you self-describe yourself as an elder, then you're an elder. <laughs> but if we don't have anyone right now who wants to begin to share, um, we it can open up for anyone. And I think the way that you do it is you just raise your hand and then turn on your, um, your turn on your, your, your phone or your video. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum as -salam. Can you just tell us who you are? And we'll um, I'm Hajja Mupita from Dearborn, Michigan. Welcome. And uh, I wanted to, um, to say uh, one thing that um, it came to my mind is that uh, all of the things that the brother said that happened uh, in the 70s, uh, even in Detroit, some things like that happened in the 60s. But um, the reality to me is that all of these uh, organizations and, and uh, events that the Muslims set up and ran, when they ran them, it, it ran as something that they were uh, promoting and that they were specifically um, emphasizing the Islamic um, participation and the Islamic point of view and the Islamic culture. And as soon as the city or somebody else, uh, uh, the school in that in one instance, uh, took over, they changed it into something else. They changed it into something um, that did not have emphasis on Islam or Muslim life or whatever. And I just wanted to uh, say that this is kind of typical. The same things have happened in uh, in Detroit area. Um, they co-opt. You know, you st we start something, and in some situations, it's a, it's a black thing. Start something for African American recognition, and they find a way to. Um, but to morph it into something that is more inclusive. And what that means, and, and this is something from our African-American history that I want everybody to pay attention to. What that means is the same thing as all lives matter. All lives matter. It takes the emphasis off of, of the black lives. And in that situation, it takes the, em the emphasis off of Muslim life or Islamic culture, and it opens it up. And I hate to say this, but that's done deliberately. It's done deliberately so that the, the people are not going to focus on the fact that there are some African-American groups that started something. The Black Panther Party is a good example of that. The Black Panther Party established um, pre-school breakfast programs that was to feed uh, African-American children in the inner cities and to make sure that they had something in their stomach so they would be ready to learn when they got to school. Um, these things that were always from the grassroots. The Black Panther Party were majority teenagers and very young adults. 
And they came up with this idea. Is this is something that is needed. It's something that will help the children. And it's something that will help the community. And it did. And it, it morphed into things like providing uh, clothing for uh, poor people, providing uh, medical assistance for some poor people. I mean, they opened clinics so that folks could just come and get free medical help. All of these things happened. And as soon as they were established, there, for some reason, there became a... What can I say? Uh, a, a wave of, uh, of dissatisfaction brought down on the people who did it. In the case of the Black Panther Party, uh, they tried to cite them as being criminals. Uh, the people were saying that we have the right to bear arms to protect our uh, communities. And of course, this is true according to the Constitution for the United States. However, because they're black people, they're considered to be somehow more aggressive and more dangerous. And they want to paint uh, all black people for folks who come from overseas. Um, I, my family was warned, uh, you do not uh, come and associate with uh, the black people here because uh, they're uh, criminals, um, they're dishonest, they're lazy, they're, all these nasty little stereotypes uh, was uh, told to people. Uh, and I percent, uh, particularly, you know, resent all of these things. But I want to make a, a point: when you're going to uh, to do something uh, in a community effort, in a civic uh, kind of broad uh, spectrum, make sure you institute in it something that that will maintain your reason for starting it. Your your uh, mission statement, you know, should put something specific in it, because these people will co-opt it and change it into something that particularly, and I'll use the term whitewashes it, but basically mm -hmm. wash you right out of it. Mm -hmm. So I don't know, that, that's something that came to mind listening to the brother. I know all of these things that he spoke of have happened and were wonderfully received by the communities they were serving. Mm -hmm. But the minute that the larger community came in, it turned into something else. So that's that. Um, Islam in America has always been strong. My brother used a term that I didn't quite uh, uh, feel comfortable with. They said that Islam was in the closet. Uh, that's not true. But Islam was not out in the forefront because uh, African Americans, for the most part, were the people uh, that were practicing Islam, you know, uh, I'll say in the open, mm -hmm. going to masajids and establishing masajids and so forth. Um, other people who were uh, foreigners, foreign born people, Mm -hmm. uh, very quietly practiced their Islam. And they did not, uh, and I hate to say this too, but I I'm 70 years old, so I'm talking from a long time ago. Um, they did not uh, uh, come out and, uh, and uh, give dawah. They did not mm -hmm. teach, you know, people in the communities where they were established, you know, wholesale. They did not introduce Islam. And some of us who had uh, our um, version of Sunni Islam, um, there was not a lot of uh, places for us to open up and go to, uh, and we could not. I mean, I don't know what to say. It was, just, it was just quiet only because the people who could uh, make a difference didn't. Black people were not just generally given a platform to speak from. But, you know, Allah knows best, and Islam has grown tremendously, and alhamdulillah, we are so proud to be Muslim and so proud to be on a program with some young people trying to, to study and learn how we can be more diverse. So thank you all for what you're doing, and thank you for your input. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum assalam. Alhamdulillah, and thank you for joining us and sharing with us your wisdom and uh, coming to us from from Michigan, uh, from Dearborn. I, for those of you who are watching this um, on, the, on a computer or a tablet or something, you would see that in the reflection PowerPoint that I have up here, uh, a prayer rug and uh, prayer beads. And I actually took that photograph uh, in a mosque in, in Dearborn, Michigan. So, hey. so, yeah. so it's kind of uh, coming full circle as well. Um, and I think it's, you, you raise really, really important points. Um, and I think it's really important for us, again, to have more of these sessions where we hear our stories with open hearts, learn about each other, learn about um, our stories, the positive stories, as well as stories of pain. And I just want to quickly, before we, you know, invite somebody else to also share their perspective, also mention to people here in Chicago, there's the Chicago History Museum.
has a wonderful exhibit called Chicago, uh, called American Medina, Stories of Muslim Chicago. And in it, there's a collection of oral histories. There's uh, what they term to be artifacts, but like you know, actual articles, pieces uh, that that individuals and mosques and organizations have lent to the uh, to the museum for a few, for the duration of the exhibit time. I think you can look at the exhibit now through uh, their online portal. Um, but inshallah, um, if the museums open up <laughs> before 2021, before the exhibit ends, uh, I would really recommend for people to. Um, to go and check that out because it's stories of Muslim Chicago that we don't always hear these these kind of untold stories of you know maybe marginal marginalized stories we could talk a little bit more about some of the language that we're using um, does anyone else want to you know have any reflections at this point If, if not, I actually would, would like to ask uh, Brother Imam Charles, if you can maybe talk a little bit about language and the language that we use uh, when discussing race and racism and, and particularly within Muslim communities, uh, maybe more recent immigrants might not know the history of certain phrases like, you know, when do you use the term black versus African American? And is there actually a better term to use? Brother Charles, you're on mute. We can't hear you. Oh, I'm sorry. Thank you. Yes, um, I was just responding to Sister Anne. Thank you. That uh, the term, in particular, Black Muslim, is something that I caution us against using. It's becoming much more popularized lately. There was a time about 40 or so years ago when that term was pretty much banished, along with the term Negro. We got rid of Negro and adopted. Uh, first, they were talking about Afro-American, and then Jesse Jackson put out uh, a statement saying that we should just call, you know, refer to African-American, to use the full word. So we, ever since we've been using the term African-American since uh, the late 80s and going into the 90s. But the word Negro, we decided to banish that because when I was growing up, that's what I was known as, a Negro. And that has all kind of negative connotations. Well, Black Muslim has been known as a cult because it was coined by the author C. Eric Lincoln back in the 50s and 60s to describe the phenomenon known as the Lost Foundation of Islam membership. We did not call ourselves that, but we pretty much adopted that term because it somewhat fit. We were seen as a cult or a sect. So that term Black Muslim refers to that particular group that was separate from the mainstream Islam. We worked very hard to become part of mainstream Islam. So we don't want to go back into being seen as some kind of separate entity or a separate group or a sect of Islam. So we would encourage using the phrase African-American Muslim or Black American Muslim as opposed to Black Muslim. We understand people use it conveniently, but it is not a good idea to adopt that particular term. Another concept that we have to be very aware of is the fact that we have as the sister said, and I really thank Sister Makita for giving a very detailed uh, recalling of her experiences, because sure enough, movements are so often, most of the time, co-opted. And even with the Black Lives Matter movement, which is very important, you will have people who are wanting to co-opt and join that, and so you have all kind of agendas hopping aboard to, to push their agenda. You have to be very careful of this. In terms of Islam, we know what our orientation is. So that's not even a question because we know as Muslims, we emphasize human nature. So we look at ourselves as part of the total human society, the, the total human um, society, which means that we look for human excellence. When the Muslim community was getting away from being called black Muslims, the Imam directed us to refer to our struggles for success as human excellence. Mm. Some people were talking about black excellence. 
He said, no, we don't want to talk about black excellence. We're part of the whole human race. So we want to encourage human excellence in competition with other human beings. Mm -hmm. So that's something we have to be sure we don't get co-opted in terms of some kind of black ideology or something like that. That's not what we should be about. But as long as we are here at this present moment, it, race is an issue. So we have to address it. Mm -hmm. We have to deal with dealing with black people. We have to accept the fact that we're black people because that's how we've been put into this box. The only way we're going to get out of this box is by accepting the fact that as black people, we have to address these issues in front of us. I don't like the term white people because white connotates people who think that they are pure. Because what's happening is that there is no such thing as quote unquote white race. It is something that people have put out there to make it seem as though there is something about being white that's better. And that's where the concept of superiority comes in. So they refer to us as people of color. Well, the overwhelming 90 some percent of the Earth's population are people of color. Mm -hmm. So why should the distinction be to call someone people of color? Why? Because there are people who are controlling the agenda, who are controlling the power, and they're controlling the language. And so they're saying that anybody who's not like them are persons of color. Mm -hmm. So you have this very small segment of the world population making everybody else defer to them as the major de uh, definition. But if, so if you don't fit their definition of being white, then you got to be a person of color. It's average, it's typical. The, the very word human has within it the concept or the term hue. Everyone mm -hmm. has a hue. So every, even people who consider themselves white, they have some hue or some kind of color to them. So I'll close with this. When the Indian population, the Native Americans, had a problem with the people who invaded them, they referred to them as the people who were without color. They called them pale face. So the only people without color are the ones who are totally pale. So why should we have to be called something other than human? That we got to be put into a category that is we're people of color as mm -hmm. though we're something different than human or different than the, the quote unquote majority. So they're no longer going to be the majority in America, but they're definitely not the majority in the world. So we shouldn't, but that's an argument that's going to have to be settled in future generations because that's a big question. The young people who are online, I want to hear from some of you all as well, because you're the ones who are going to have to help to usher in this change where we don't defer to the language of the oppressor class or the colonizers. We are going by their language. We should not continue in the future to go by a language that is, makes us defer to be called something other than what is the mainstream. We are the mainstream. We are human. We don't have to be called people of color. We already know everybody's got color. Mm -hmm. But now we're in this box. To fight out of this box, we gotta accept the fact that we're black and the fact that they call themselves white. And many Muslims, when, we, when they came to this land, were classified as white. Mm. Immigrants who came from different countries, and I, I noticed this when I was a teenager, applying for jobs, on the job application, it referred to people of Asian or Middle Eastern uh, immigration mm -hmm. as white. Yeah. <laughs> and they have really been the ones to bolster the white population in America. And just recently, we've become wise to that. So in the census, now, we're looking at this in a different way. So you don't have to call yourselves white, but the whole thing about white is a superior complex, superiority complex. We want to get away from that because they think that to be white is to be more pure and then to be a person of color, you're the exception from pure. Mm. Right. So we know, I think you, you, you mentioned this earlier when we talked about the ayah from Surah Al-Hujurat, uh, the Quranic ayah 49, uh, 13. Um, you know, we know that people are, you know, different races, different colors, but really there is no, that does not show who's better or who's worse. The thing that God looks at is what is our relationship with Allah? What is our taqwa? What is our God consciousness? 
Um, and we know, of course, that in the prophet, uh, peace be upon him, in his last sermon, he took care very much to, it, to tell the companions and then to tell us as well that an Arab is not better than a non-Arab, a white is not better than a black. Right? It's only just in your heart, your actions, how you treat other people. Uh, this outer layer, uh, this outer kind of visual that other people see uh, is not what makes us who we are on the inside. And that's not how we're going to be judged. And it's not how we, uh, are, uh, we should see each other. And actually, um, we had a couple of comments that I want to read out because maybe some people are not in the chat. Uh, Sister Lynn Muhammad says, Allah says, he made us different so that we will know each other and not despise each other, which is really important. Um, and, uh, you, you know, there's some other really great commentary. I'm going to in the chat, this idea that white perpetuates this myth that white people don't have a quote-unquote ethnic identity, right? And and so that's that's from Samia Nagib. And so I think it's really um, in this question of identities and how people identify what boxes people are, are placed in are only important because of the social structure that we're in. We know it's not important um, based on our spiritual relationship with God and our spiritual relationship with one another. Unfortunately, the society in which we live actually puts people in boxes. Um, and we, I, I, I would posit that we need to uh, acknowledge that and then we need to also figure out how best to respond to it. And uh, for those of you who are following on your computers, I just, uh, changed our PowerPoint to a quote from Marguerite Hill, who is a co-founder and the executive director of the um, Muslim ARC, the Muslim Anti-Racism uh, anti Collaborative. Um, and her quote is, I'm going to read it out loud for those of you who are uh, not able to read it, uh, is this. This biggest issue for us as Muslims is not just Islamophobia. It's systemic racism and white supremacy. If we are committed to the project of decolonization, anti-racism, anti-Islamophobia, anti-oppression, we will be successful. But if we're only focused on Islamophobia, then we're going to leave people behind. They're going to leave me behind because I'll still be subjected to racial violence, unquote. Um, and what she means by that is uh, she's African-American. So she's talking about the racial violence that African-Americans uh, face in the US. So I'm gonna, I actually wanna ask people to, uh, oops, to share their, their thoughts on this. Give, give me some feedback on, on this and, and the conversation that we just had right now about language, right? Because she's using specific words here, decolonization, anti-racism, anti-Islamophobia. Uh, you know, what, what are your thoughts on, on the words she's using and also what she's actually saying? Like if we're only, if we Muslims are only focused on Islamophobia, then we're also not able to look at other forms of oppression. And here I would love, love, love for some of our younger uh, members to come and join us. And if you consider yourself young uh, and, and other people will consider you young, <laughs> please join us. Come on, I know some of you young people like to talk. Go ahead. <laughs> you can just unmute yourself and and pop right in. Uh, can you can you repeat what exactly you're you're asking for us to answer, just to clarify? Sure. So Marguerite's quote. I'm going to actually read her quote, and I want to ask you all to think about um to just give your feedback to what she's saying both the words that she's using and also the the larger the underlying message and marguerite is an african-american muslim woman so quote this the biggest issue for us as muslims is not just islamophobia it's systemic racism and white supremacy if we are committed to the project of decolonization anti-racism, anti-Islamophobia, anti-oppression will be successful. But if we're only focused on Islamophobia, then we're going to leave people behind. They're going to leave me behind because I'll still be subjected to racial violence, unquote.
Assalamualaikum. I'm going to try speaking from here. So it's less echo. Um, I just wanted to add my two cents to what we were talking about. And can I you give your name? I'm sorry, can yeah. you just give your name first? Uh, Nabiha. Sorry, I'm on the computer and the phone, but the computer is easier because the echo is coming from being on both. Um, so I think in a lot of like Islamic circles, even like Muslim student associations, when it comes to like Muslim students participating, a lot of our conversation tends to be around Islamophobia. And I don't think we address decolonization, anti-racism as much as we should as being issues that we as Muslims should be talking about or or consider part of our deen to address. And I think those conversations have been increasing, but I remember during my time in different MSAs or even different youth groups, those were not the main conversations. And those were things that I feel we didn't bring up enough. And now I think we're realizing that like this quote is saying that we can change the perspective, but there's still gonna be parts of our ummah that are gonna be left behind. And um, especially depending, like I'm Indian, so, I think I've been s surrounded by groups that have been more my like ethnicity sometimes and it allows like other groups that are facing a different set of injustices to become invisible in our community. So that's all I have. Thank you, Nabiha. I think, um, yeah, that's true. That, that self-awareness and self-reflection is really important to have um, as we frame our conversation. And by the way, this conversation is online, but we hope to actually have that uh, build real, you know, real relationships and deeper relationships among each other. So this is just the start, inshallah. Um, well, Sister Hina, I'd like to respond to the um, quote that you gave about sure. the um, no uh, Arab is not, superior to a non-Arab and a non-Arab is not superior to an Arab. And on face value, we hear that, we accept it, and at the same time, unwittingly, we kind of don't adhere to that because it's, especially as uh, an African-American, indigenous Muslim here in America, but even other Muslims I've noticed it's almost like a demand that in order to be accepted, we have to show that we identify with Arab culture. And the more you identify with Arab culture, the more accepted you are as a Muslim. And not so much about the language, because we know the importance of the language of Arabic in terms of understanding Quran, but in terms of adopting some customs and some of the outward trappings of the Arab culture kind of has something to do with almost, we're not supposed to have any hierarchy in Islam, but there's almost like a hierarchy in terms of how close you are to showing that you have adopted the way of the Arab people as far as Arab being identified as Muslim. Because many people don't realize that only 15% of Muslims in the world, or somewhere between 10 and 15% are Arab, Whereas the influence is so profound of the Arab culture, which is a beautiful culture, nothing to take away from Arab culture. But when people are expected that they have to identify as, almost as an Arab to be accepted as a Muslim, then this is a way of almost seeing Arab as superior in terms of that. So we understand the concept, but as one who has experienced this, and has seen sometimes because as African Americans, because we were stripped of our culture, it's easy for us to fall into that. We want so much to identify with some type of culture uh, beside our own past as slave history, that we abandon our own ethnicity in terms of adopting someone else's ethnicity in order to be accepted as Muslim. So in that sense, it's almost like seeing that as superior. Not that, and as I said before, this is benign. No one is really enforcing this, mm -hmm. but it's like a benign way that we are expected to be seen as lesser than, and in order to aspire to be greater as a Muslim, we have to be more Arab-like. Mm 
Mm -hmm. Yeah. And especially, it is especially frustrating because the first Muslims on this land, uh, you know, were from Africa, primarily from West Africa, but probably, but also from uh, the Iberian Peninsula, Spain and Portugal. Um, and, you know, these, these were people, some of them might have known some Arabic because of their knowledge of Quran and Islamic sciences, so, and, but most of them didn't. Most of them spoke uh, languages uh, that Muslims in Western Africa speak to this day. Uh, so that's, that's really important as well. I actually just, uh, as you were speaking, Brother Imam, I, was, uh, I posted on the, the PowerPoint um, a, a small um, graph, graphic from the ISPU, the Institute for Social Policy and Understanding, and it talks about how actually in the U.S. there is no majority race among Muslims. It's really important for us to realize that, that there's no, like if we think of who is the one American Muslim, you can't say, oh, well, he or she is definitely Arab or he or she is definitely, you know, African American or South Asian. It could be any one of us. Um, and of course, we know that Latinx Muslims are actually the fastest growing Muslim community. Um, so I think I, I want to ask actually Sister Samia to join in and anyone who is not speaking so that we can get the, the voices. If you're not speaking, uh, put yourself, uh, go ahead and put yourself on mute. I'm going to do that. And, and, and I'm going to ask Sister Samia Nagib to um, share her perspective as well. Assalamu alaikum. Can you hear me? Yes. Uh, um, this is Samia, and I just first want to um, thank the organizers um, for having this conversation and uh, Brother Charles um, for his uh, perspective and, and for sharing his insight with us. Um, as someone who is uh, uh, just interested and in, in passionate in this sort of work, um, I appreciated Ms. Hill's perspective. And um, the quote that you asked for us to reflect on, I agree um, with her that in doing uh, social justice work as Muslims, um, we need to remember that uh, to look at um, various things and not just Islamophobia, um, something that Ms. Hill didn't include, but I think should also be um, remembered is classism and racism. And I appreciate her mentioning that um, if, if we're just looking at uh, one thing, uh, folks will be left behind because if, if we're not considering um, broader injustices, um, then that's just likely to happen. And um, the intersections of people's identities do matter. So just like, you know, when I'm thinking about myself, I, I consider um, you know, my identity as a Desi, Pakistani American, um, Muslim woman, an educator, all those facets, um, they matter. So I think we can't just look at, um, you know, Muslims, we have to remember that people's um, racial or ethnic identities also um, impact their experiences. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, I think that's also important because, you know, um, Muslim women, for example, who wear the headscarf in the U.S. Uh, are targets of Islamophobia in higher numbers than, you know, Muslim women who don't wear a headscarf and most Muslim men. And the men who are, you know, a lot of men who are impacted by Islamophobia or bigotry against Muslims uh, are actually Sikh men. They practice an entirely different religion, but they wear a, a, a turban, many of them, and they grow long beards. And so, you know, a racist who's out there doesn't really know the difference between a Sikh and a Muslim. And so then they attack, um, you know, the, the Sikh men. We know that the first person who was shot and killed after the attacks of 9-11 was a Sikh man. And so I, I think um, it's really important for us as we have these conversations to not also, to, to also not um, ignore the other facets of our identities um, in these conversations and what the outside world um, sees and how the outside world responds to us. Um, and I think it's really important uh, for us to know that actually the, the US Muslim community 
is not only diverse in and of itself, but it's actually the most ethnically and racially diverse faith community in the United States, right? And, and that's really unique. Um, the next slide that I have up uh, that some of you can see is also, again, from the ISPU, the Institute for Social Policy and Understanding. And you see that uh, you, the, the, the graph is pretty clear that, you know, um, the majority of Jewish Americans, the majority of Catholic Americans, Protestant Americans um, are, are actually white. And, and then you have kind of large majorities or a plurality of Protestant um, Americans who are 16% who are uh, African American. But among Muslim communities, it's really different. 25% of Muslims in the US identify as black or African American, 24% identify as white, which well, let's put an asterisk on that for a second. 18% say Asian um, uh, and 18% say Arab. Uh, seven is mixed, and uh, five percent is uh, Hispanic. And these are people, of course, who are self-reporting. Um, and it's always very difficult to to actually gauge um, the real numbers uh, because you know many of us are are mixed, and many of us don't actually want to share uh, our our um, our racial identities. So I'm actually going to uh, take my prerogative as um, as the co-facilitator <laughs> to share with you a little bit about myself as we uh, go into the second uh, half of our conversation today, inshallah. And that is, you know, as I was listening to all of the conversations and all of the truth bombs somebody mentioned, and the, the gems of wisdom from Brother Imam Charles and Sister Mokita and Sister Samia and all the peoples, uh, Sister Nabiha who spoke, um, you know, I was kind of reflecting on my own self uh, you know, uh, most people who, who see me think that they know what my racial identity is and they just assume what it is and they put me in a box without asking. Um, but uh, I'm most typically not what people think that I am. And uh, I won't ask you to guess, I'll just tell you, my parents are immigrants from Sudan, which is a country in Northeast Africa. Um, we speak Arabic, so it's an Arabized country, Arabized Black African uh, country. And I speak Arabic as my native tongue, uh, but I ident identify as a, as a person of the African diaspora, as a Black Arab, if you will. And that's why sometimes when I um, speak and say the words African American, I mean people who are African American. Uh, when I say African immigrants or uh, black Muslims, for me, that, that encompasses the entire diaspora, although I learned something or I kind of internalized something today, and that is in the U.S. there's a particular, um, in, a, in, in a particular time in history, black Muslims meant something very different to what I use it, right? When I say black Muslims, I mean people anyone who identifies as black and Muslim. But in the US in a particular time and place and among certain people, black Muslims meant you know, adherence of the Nation of Islam, which is certainly not uh, what I'm referring to. If I wanna to refer to those people, I would refer to them specifically as a nation. So anyway, um, I wanted to, to mention that to you because um, for me, being somebody who identifies as black, somebody who who's the daughter of African immigrants, someone who's a native Arabic speaker and who grew up uh, attending an Arabic speaking masjid and attending an Islamic school, which was primarily Arabic and primarily Levantine Arabs, people who um, would be legally designated as white and maybe culturally, uh, maybe their parents would identify as white, even if maybe today they would identify as people of color. Um, I wanted to, you know, maybe have that leap onto our next conversation, and that's a conversation about privileges, right? So in some ways, I'm privileged that um, my, my racial identity uh, is ambiguous. Um, in some ways, in Muslim communities, I'm privileged because my parents are immigrants, because Arabic is my native language, because I can read the Quran and the hadith and the Islamic sources in a language that's easy for me, or maybe not easy, but it's you know native for me, because as some of you might know, um, modern Arabic speakers don't always, you know, we're not running around speaking in Quranic classical Arabic at home. Uh, we have our own dialects, but in general, we can understand um, 
the religious texts fairly easily, especially, you know, if you had any years of study of, uh, of, of classical Arabic. So um, in that sense, you know, I have some privileges, but in other senses, I don't have privileges within the Muslim community. Um, and I want to ask us um, to really think about that. Like, what, what are the privileges that you hold? Um, and what are the, 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 the spaces where you, you are not, you feel like you're not privileged? So before we do that, um, or actually, I wanted to, uh, I don't know if somebody had a, had a comment. I'm, I, I see my chat box is, is flashing. <laughs> somebody says, guilty. I thought you were Indian or Pakistani. I never thought you would, uh, you were Sudanese. Yeah, the, really the only people who, who know that I'm Sudanese are other East Africans, <laughs> and everyone else just assumes that I'm South Asian. Um, the, uh, somebody asked what the data source is for the slides. Uh, all of the graphic, uh, all the data that I'm sharing um, is, a, is from the Institute for Social Policy and Understanding, ISPU.org. I would uh, recommend that you check out their website. I'm affiliated with ISPU uh, as an educator, and it's a wonderful resource for our community. It's a, essentially a think tank and a research organization that studies American Muslim communities um, you know, uh, and the challenges that we face and who we are, what we believe, et cetera. It's a great, it's a great resource. And not only because I'm affiliated with them, I've long thought so. Um, <laughs> so, so yeah, uh, yes, thank you so much for, for putting that, um, for putting that URL up. So uh, I would actually ask us to, if you have a sheet of paper next to you, or if you could just, you know, use your fingers I'm going, to, I'm going to ask us to engage in a small uh, privilege exercise. Okay, so if you lived in the same home all of your life, uh, give yourself, and, and, you know, let's say for your childhood, so your first 18 years of your life, you lived in the same home, give yourself one point. If you know a member of the mosque board, Give yourself one point. If your parents speak English, give yourself one point. Does anyone need me to repeat these, uh, these three? Okay. If your parents speak English without an accent, give yourself two points. Okay. If you and your immediate family, your mom, dad, siblings, um, or your spouse, are US citizens, give yourself five points. If you never worried about whether your parents can afford your next meal or whether you can afford the next meal for your child, give yourself five points, okay? Does anyone need me to repeat anything so far? Okay. Our last segment, if you, uh, sorry, if the imam or the board member of the mosque, any board member of the mosque are of your race or ethnicity, give yourself 10 points. <clears throat> if you contact a board member of your mosque and you know that they will respond to you, Give yourself 10 points. If you are a male, give yourself 10 points. Okay. So the, that's the privilege exercise. That's the first part. So uh, uh, why 10 points for, oh, okay. All right, so people are asking questions. Uh, I'm gonna answer that question, why 10 points for males? Um, but somebody asked for me to repeat the last three, so the 10 points. So if, if the imam and the board members, or, or say the imam or the board members of the mosque of your race or your ethnicity, give yourself 10 points. If you contact a board member and know that they will respond to you, give yourself 10 points. And if you are a male, if you identify as a man or a male, give yourself 10 points. Okay, 
So does anyone, like I would love for you all to, to write down in the chat function um, where you're at, what's your points? <laughs> Okay, does anyone, <laughs> that's a good question. Is there one for subtracting points for being black? I actually didn't wanna subtract anything. Um, I wanted to, um, I wanted to, to show people what the, um, the, uh, the, the head start that some people get and others don't get. Um, so do people, does anyone want to uh, share what their number is like speak and then talk about what this what this exercise how, how this exercise made you feel um i got 27 in mine by the way so i see any i think i see from 18 to 34 points Oh, Sister Samia, was that, did you want to speak? Is your, I think you're muted. Um, oh, I, I don't want to uh, oh. <laughs> dominate uh, conversation. Or I want to share the um, airspace with others. Um, okay. But um, for, for mine, I had 21. Um, that question where if you contacted someone that you would know that they would respond to you, I'm just not sure about it. Mm -hmm. um, not that I've, you know, uh, attempted uh, communication in that regard, um, but for that reason, I um, didn't add those add, add 10 points. Um, so perhaps it would be 31, I'm not sure. But um, I've done similar exercises to this, and I, I always appreciate uh, the reminder um, of evaluating and just reflecting on privilege. Uh, I know as someone who has um, um, darker skin color than some, but you know, lighter um, than people that identify as black or African-American, um, that, that's something that, um, a privilege that I do have. Uh, and that I think the, the purpose of me thinking about that privilege is in what spaces are um, those members of our community's voices not um, um, emphasis, uh, welcomed, perhaps, or included, and then what can I do with my privilege to make sure that um, those necessary perspectives and um, um, that they are included and those people are welcome. So um, on that note, <laughs> I, I want to make sure that I um, share the airspace and uh, we hear um, from all people, but thank you for asking me for my um, uh, sharing. Thank you. Yeah, your, your, the square came up on my screen, so I thought that you wanted to share. Thank you for sharing. I, there's a comment that says, the intersection between class and money privilege with race as a result of social infrastructure is interesting to think about. Can you say more about that? Like share your screen or share your voice and sh and say more about that. Well, this is Nabiha again. <laughs> Welcome. <laughs> um, that's just something that I feel comes up a lot in a, uh, many ways. I think as minorities or people of color, we'd like to think we're away from the structures that we consider quote unquote, like white people the majority to create. But in a lot of ways, if you have money or class privilege, you're not subjected to the same level in certain circumstances that other people are that don't have that choice. And then you buy into the system that oppresses other people. And I don't, I think sometimes it's easy for us to not think about it, think of ourselves as separate from the system because we're not the majority race, but we too can end up participating without thinking about it in the same systems that are oppressing our like, you know, black, um, you know, like other people that are not, ex yeah, I think I'm rambling a bit, mm -hmm. but. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, no, I, I think that's, that's also really, really important. That's something that I've always thought about too. Um, you know, when we, when we look at um, not just the numbers through actual scientific data, but just even from our anecdotes and how many people that we know are educated from back home, um, right back home, but are underemployed when they come here to the U.S. And so there's an intersection definitely between class and, and, and race that exists in the U.S. that maybe that wouldn't exist if they were still uh, in their home countries. Um, and so it's, it's really important when we think about that because our mosques are actually, um, in some ways, they're microcosms of America, but in other ways, they're actually pretty different. They're separate, right? Um, you know, like I, I'm, one of the questions earlier somebody had asked in the chat, like, why do you give 10 points if you're a male? <laughs> I actually was thinking of giving like 50 points <laughs> because for, for if you were male to add 50 points to yourself. Um, and that's because, you know, men in Muslim, in, in, our, in our mosques, uh, have a lot more privileges than, than women or 100 points <laughs> um, because um, because they have access to the imam in a way that most women don't have access to. They have access to some of the board members. You know, they, they, the, the prayer hall is, is the, where they pray. Whereas for women, um, that's not always the case. We see the imam through a TV screen. Um, and as I reflect on that, I know that me personally, that's not the case. I can call the imam of the mosque down the street. And he would take my 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 call, right? Um, and and that's because of the privilege that I have in my particular community, that is not affected, or let's say that's not um, me being a woman doesn't take away from that. But that's just because of the personal relationship that that my family has, right, with the mosque and with and with the imam. Um, but you know, maybe another woman wouldn't be able to to have that. So I think it's really, I, th I think it is really important to look at all the different parts of our identities uh, that give us privilege and that don't give us privilege. Another thing that I wanted to also uh, include here um, as a resource uh, and as something to think about um, is if you are able-bodied, that's another, you know, maybe another hundred points, right? And especially if you're an able-bodied male, um, you know, some of our mosques are not built to accommodate women in, in wheelchairs, for example, or women who use a cane or a crutch to move around. Um, and here I would love to highlight the organization Muhsin, M-U-H-S-E-N.org, that works with mosques to help them uh, create spaces that are welcoming for individuals with, uh, with, um, with disabilities and their families. So um, I, I saw that some people, there's somebody who had, there are several of you who had uh, points in the 20s. Does anyone in the 20s want to talk and share your perspective? Just, just go ahead and mute, unmute yourself and then you can speak. I even see somebody who had 18. Um, so if we, um, if, if, if somebody doesn't want to speak right now, um, what I would, what I would like to do is to go on to the next uh, slide, which is a self reflection. Um, and I would love for you again to also think about these and I'm going to read them out loud unless somebody else wants to read this. Um, again, read it out loud for those of you who are unable to see the screen or to read it. Um, so the self-reflection check-in, and this is actually something that I ask when I do my trainings uh, in mosques about you know, how mosques can be more inclusive in general, whether it's specifically about women or if it's you know, regarding the convert communities uh, or young people. Um, is I want you to think about yourself and just, just you know, we can have a short conversation about it if, if folks feel comfortable. But here's the self-reflection check-in um, that you can say yes uh, or no to, to each one of these statements. Number one, I look 
Oh, or actually, uh, Afshin, uh, did you want to speak? Assalamu alaikum. This is Afshin. And Jazakallah Khairan for arranging um, such an informative session. And um, I just wanted, I have posted a message in the chat box. I believe you said that some people aren't able to read it. And I just wanted to point out that Alhamdulillah, um, our mosque and I'm a regular attendee at Plainfield Mosque, Al-Aqsa Mosque, and Alhamdulillah with confidence, I can confirm that our mosque is very much ladies friendly, Alhamdulillah. And inshallah, would love for you to visit sometime and give us an opportunity to show around. Inshallah. Alhamdulillah. Oh, thank you so much for 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 uh, reading your comments out loud. Um, and I'm I'm always trying to be better myself as well to to uh, ensure that you know folks who don't have access to the visual that they actually hear what what we're saying. And I really appreciate it. I have never visited your masjid, and I would love to visit it uh, at some point once the quarantine. Um, lets up a little bit uh, inshallah and i also really want to visit it because i attended uh, uh the the high school that i attended is al-aqsa high school which is aqsa high school for girls uh also in the suburbs so i have a you know a real love for any any mosque that's uh that you know of course we have our our religious centers as well um, and so, and, and that's another comment uh, that, that Sarwat has written, and that's something that made me very interested uh, in helping to facilitate this conversation, that the Al-Aqsa Mosque that you have out in Plainfield is more diverse um, than other area mosques. And I think that that's probably true, just my, my own experience um, in, in the suburbs. So uh, I'm really, I'm really happy, and I'm really happy to read some of these comments um, from Nabiha as well, uh, highlighting what Sister Afshin said. And, she, and Nabiha says, Al-Aqsa has been great with the youth girls program and for being a comfortable space. I love that. Alhamdulillah. Um, I really, really love that. And um, so, yeah, so we have uh, for the next half hour before we close, uh, I want us to think about, okay, so we started out, I think it was Brother Ahmad who talked about the social justice project that you will be doing, um, serving food uh, and, uh, and, and serving uh, the needy, the hungry in, in the area. And this is part of the um, CIOGC, uh, you know, um, challenge that they have asked communities, mosque communities in the Chicagoland area to, to, to participate in. Um, and although uh, everyone has been saying that Al-Aqsa Masjid is really diverse, it's really welcoming, it's open, and I know from my conversations with some of the, the mosque goers there that that's true, that the board is a board that is um, open to hearing from from the people in the congregation and implementing feedback as much as possible, holding these kinds of conversations, which is really, really important. Um, I want us to also think about, I mentioned at the beginning, uh, about an hour ago now, what service learning is. And service learning is the combination of serving others while learning something about yourself. And so this, especially for the young people who will be participating in the, um, in, in the volunteer program this summer, and really anyone who is serving their community in any capacity. I want you to do the self-reflection check-in as much as possible, and I could certainly email this um, to, uh, to Sister Sarwat or Brother Imam Charles, but to really ask yourself or, or you know, ask yourself these statements or say these statements and say yes or no. And the first is, and again, I'm just reading these just uh, uh, in order to be accessible for everyone. The first is, I look, speak, I look like, speak the same languages as, eat the same foods as everyone in my Muslim community. The second is, I can enter any mosque anytime in my quote unquote everyday clothes. Number three, I can hear the khutbah, the sermon clearly and need no translation. And this translation also includes ASL, American Sign Language. Number four, I live in walking or driving distance to my mosque and I have access to a car. Number five, people assume I am a practicing Muslim because uh, people assume I am a practicing Muslim. Number six, I look like the leaders in my mosque. Number seven, 
I can access every space in my mosque with no difficulty. Every public space, I should say. <laughs> number eight, everyone in my family is welcome in my local mosque. And number nine, I have access to my imam. So as I read this, I saw that the chat button is like flying, flipping up and down. Um, and uh, there's a comment from somebody who said, my family and I are huge fans of Muhsin because ableism is a, real, is a very real issue in all communities, including in our Muslim communities and our mosques. Um, and I think some of the conversation has been around that recently here about translation, ASL translation, American Sign Language translation. Um, now, Muhsin does actually provide uh, that, and I would recommend if that's something that the community wants and the board uh, agrees to is to get in touch with them. They're actually based here in Chicago. Um, and uh, Sister Juhi Tahir is an amazing, amazing uh, human being and wonderful, beautiful person and uh, is, a, is the founder and director of, of Muhsin. And um, she and the organization can help, uh, help with that um, uh, in terms of getting ASL translation if, if, if that's needed. So, uh, yes, definitely kudos to Sister Julie. She's an absolute gem um, in our community, and I hope uh, everyone uh, supports that organization and keeps her and her family in your du'as. So uh, I want to actually go to our final uh, quotes, uh, our final prompt for the discussion. And again, it's looking at the social justice, uh, all of the volunteering that you're, that you're going to be doing. Um, and the last prompt uh, is something that it's from an article that made the rounds by Dr. Javid Akhtar, who's actually also from the Chicagoland area. And um, he, uh, he wrote a really wonderful piece, which we will share to any, for anyone who um, uh, who, who registered, and I pulled out some quotes from his piece. And I can go ahead and read them. They're up on the slide, and uh, I would love to get your feedback in the last, um, you know, we, we can spend a few minutes on this, and then we can jump into the final conversation around how, how you're thinking about pulling together the um, the service projects, inshallah. Okay, so from his article, he writes, recent events have shocked me into the realization that I have been woefully ignorant of the racist past of my country. I have lived the cocooned life of, quote, a privileged minority. There are millions like me. As an immigrant physician from India, I have, ha I have been happily pursuing the American dream. I cannot be more grateful to my adopted country for giving me success. I am immensely proud of how well my family has done. With rare exceptions, there hasn't been a day when I did not shake my head and say, quote, what a great country. I have told myself I am not a racist and that I understood the way African Americans felt. Now I know I was being disingenuous with myself. Some of it is the failure to recognize my subconscious racism and simple ignorance about the country's racist history. I carry an additional burden that the benefits that I enjoy are the results of the sacrifices made by others during the civil rights struggle. I am standing on the shoulders of giants." End quote. I wanna add here that he writes in his article about um, all the history in the United States uh, that affect a lot of the history that affected African Americans even after the end of this of the Civil War and he writes about how he didn't know that like the Tulsa uh, the Tulsa massacres for example 1919 and I don't remember what else that he wrote about but you know some of what we heard about earlier from brother Imam Muhammad the stories of America that many of us uh, are not privy to and some of us don't don't you know, go out and, and research, don't go out and learn, and don't even necessarily know what kind of questions we should ask um, the people around us. So I'm going to actually repeat his last 
uh, sentence or our last two sentences because I really want us to focus on this and have a conversation inshallah an honest conversation between um, our immigrant origin brothers and sisters on the call and our african-american brothers and sisters on the call and he says quote I carry an additional burden that the benefits that I enjoy are the results of the sacrifices made by others during the civil rights struggle I am standing on the shoulders of giants. So I'm going to pause here, primarily because I also need to have a sip of water. But I would love to hear people's comments, people's feedback, and your thoughts on what Dr. Akhtar has, uh, has written. And just go ahead and unmute yourself. Or you can write on the chat function. But I would uh, like it if you would just speak. Uh, so while others are thinking about what they want to say, I would just like to um, say that that line really, really gets to me. Um, I grew up in the South Asian community, came here in the 70s, um, and I believe that the South Asian community at the time was so busy just trying to make a life for themselves that they really didn't think about everything that came before we arrived. Mm -hmm. um, and the fact that the fact that we have the privileges, the ability to go out and, and make our way and, and, and have a good life for our children is really because of those civil rights struggles that happened before us, mm -hmm. of um, Martin Luther King Jr., um, Malcolm X, because they were struggling against white supremacy and we still are st struggling, yes, but it's much easier for us now because white supremacy affects us brown people too, right? Mm -hmm. But because so much had been struggled before, we didn't really see that struggle. And we came here and we thought, hey, we can do this. We can make our way. And I think a little bit, we were kind of skating along until 9-11 too. Mm -hmm. And at that point, I think it struck us that maybe we aren't as privileged or aren't don't, don't have that clear path that we thought we had um, because we were doing well, financially, right? Mm -hmm. um, and I think that starting from there, I think the generation that has grown up here, um, the generation that came to awareness during the 9-11, um, I think they've really opened their eyes and they've seen how much all of our freedoms are wrapped up in each, in each other, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, but another thing that I think that we haven't realized is that I think a lot of the, um, so, and I'm just going to keep it short, I'm sorry, the South Asians that came here, they always came with the thought of we're going to go back, right? Mm -hmm. There was this idea of we're going to go back and that's our country and those are our people and that's who we look like and that's how we identify, whether that was conscious or unconscious. Um, and because of that, it's so much easier for us to say, well, you know, we'll go out and go do a protest for the Kashmiris. We'll go out and do a protest against Modi and we'll go out and do a protest um, for the Uyghurs, you know, just because of that, uh, that Islamic, uh, uh, that uh, Islamic uh, uh, identity that we have with them. But it's so much harder for us to say, hey, the, the, the Black Lives Matter movement that whole that whole struggle is very much also ours because there are so many african american muslim brothers and sisters who are our community here we are part of that community and we need to be continuously reminding of ourselves that they are not the other we are all together and that our identity is much with the muslims here of every color as it is with our families and 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 you know the the communities that we left back home right um I'm sorry if that wasn't clear. It's just kind of what I wanted to say. No, I kind of grew up with all this stuff and I've been, you know, struggling against it my whole life in my own families and my own communities mm -hmm. and my own budget and um, just such an important conversation. And I thank you the way that you have facilitated this. You and Brother Charles has really, I, I believe, has opened our eyes even more. And I think this is something that is not to be done once, but to don't be done continuously and at every masjid and every uh, every city and every state of the United States and the world. I think it's mm -hmm. necessary. Yeah, I think, I mean, you you put everything so succinctly and beautifully, uh, Sister Sarwat. Uh, it reminds me, um, you know, also that actually most of the Muslim immigrants today who came, came directly as a result of the Civil Rights Movement, right? So like the Civil Rights uh, Act was passed in 1964 and um, the, 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 in 1965, the twin legislation 
uh, was the, it was the Immigration and Naturalization Act of 1965 that allowed non-white immigration to come to the U.S. in large numbers for the first time um, in, in the U.S. and, and in, in the history of, of this land after Europeans came here and established this country. And I think that's really important because those of us who are immigrants, even, even those of us who are immigrants from Africa, came here because of the struggles of the civil rights movement. I mean, just as a direct result of that. Um, there's a reason why the early, um, if you go again, as I mentioned, to the Chicago History Museum, and you look at some of the artifacts there, some of the earliest artifacts of Muslims in Chicago, there's a reason why those are Albanian and Bosnian <laughs> and, and, other, and other Slavic Muslims. And that's because it was Europeans were allowed to immigrate here um, and, and everyone else was not. Um, and so I think that's, that's really, really uh, an important piece of uh, our history that we need to always keep in mind, um, especially as we want to build something new. And the other thing that I was reminded as you were speaking uh, is that we always have to remember um, that the very first Muslims on this land were African, were Africans, were black people, the descendants whose descendants are African American Muslims. And if we think about that from our own um, religious history and our tradition, we can think about the Ansar and the Muhajirin. And, um, Right, and so like the Muhajirin were the Muslims who emigrated from Mecca to Medina, and the Ansar, the helpers, were the Muslims who were converted to Islam and were in Medina and welcomed the Meccans. Um, and, and welcomed the Meccans not just like, oh hey, welcome, you know, <laughs> like here's here here's a, a box of cookies, but like really really welcomed them into their homes, into their lives. Um, you know, shared their food and their livelihood. Some of them, you know, shared their families with the um, with with the new immigrants immigrants to the United States. Right, and so and um, somebody said, "Welcome, like take half." Yes, yes. I mean, even to the point where, um, you, uh, you know, I'm actually I don't want to say it because I don't have a specific. Um, uh, Delil or a specific uh, kind of uh, place that I could say this is exactly where I got it from. But yes, uh, I certainly was taught when I was in my Islamic high school that people, the, the Meccans, when they moved to Medina, and some of them had literally nothing, and some of them even lost their spouses, they married into um, the families of Medina. And this, this is our tradition as Muslims. Like These are the, the shoulders of the giants um, that we stand on. And for those of us who came to this country or our parents who came to this country willingly, um, we have the obligation to not view African-American Muslims as second-class citizens or second-class Muslims. They were the ones here first, right? And not only that, we can look at ourselves even if we come with education or come with money, right? Like Dr. Akhtar was saying, uh, you know, he this country was really good to him. He was able to, to make a financial, to be financially successful here. Um, there's still the story of an, uh, of an immigrant leaving your homeland and coming to a new place. Well, what is our obligation to the Ansar that, we've, that we find ourselves among and who uh, welcome us? So I don't know if this is um, too vague. <laughs> I know that Sister Sarwad wants to clarify something, so just go ahead and jump in. Uh, just, uh, I was actually just typing. I wanted to just t say one thing about the Ansar and the and the Muhajirun is the one thing that I've talked to when I talk to non-Muslims is that the first lesson of the Islamic State, the first Islamic State, was love mm -hmm. more than anything. The love between Ansar and the Muhajirun and taking care of your community, the ones who are needy. And I, I think we constantly need to remind ourselves of and, and thank you for bringing that up. The thing that I wanted to clarify is just something I said before. I said, you know, our, our eyes were open after uh, at 9-11. Mm -hmm. I, I didn't mean to say that we were posting along no problems at all. Yes, we have all, as, as brown people, as minorities, we did see, um, you know, uh, individual racism, individual prejudice, the uh, way people have talked to us, our teachers. But I don't think we really, really, really understood or really faced that systemic discrimination until the surveillance after 9-11, mm -hmm. until the um, 
until the towns started saying no Sharia law here and all of this stuff became more and more in the open and that clear Islamophobia, even the term Islamophobia really arose after that time period before we were definitely feeling uh, prejudice as uh, as brown people or as people who spoke, who spoke a different accent, people who were, it was very easy for them to make fun of us on mm -hmm. things like The Simpsons. But definitely, so we weren't coasting along, but we didn't understand, I don't think, start understanding systemic discrimination um, until 9-11. And now we really need to understand how that has been going on for hundreds of years with our African-American brothers and sisters who really, who were the ones who were here first before us. Yeah, uh, I, I think that's really important. Um, also, because you talked about the surveillance after 9-11, um, there, you know, a lot of our African-American brothers and sisters could tell you stories from, from here until the end of time about COINTELPRO and, and the surveillance, um, you know, in, in previous uh, generations that they knew very well. And that if there had been um, a relationship of equality and of uh, respect, uh, two-way respect, um, you know, here, I think from our immigrant Muslim side, uh, maybe many of us would have been more open to hearing and learning and then uh, and therefore uh, protecting ourselves uh, or, or at least being more uh, ready for what happened uh, in terms of that surveillance. Um, Brother Imam uh, Charles, I think you, uh, you wanted to jump in here. Yes, uh, thank you, Sister Ann. Perfect timing for another bit of history I'd like to share along the lines of the cooperation between the indigenous and immigrant Muslim community. In 1999, there was a presidential election and the Muslim community as a whole, nationally and locally, endorsed George W. Bush for president. And the reason that they went with the Republican Party was because of the issue of anti-abortion. Now, if we had been consulted as African-American Muslims, we would have warned our brothers and sisters, please do not go that route. The only reason that the so-called right-wing political party adopts the anti-abortion issue is to give themselves an air of self-righteousness. So they feel that that is a moral argument that gives them the moral high ground. They do not care about that issue. They use it to promote themselves as though they are uh, entitled to the moral high ground. If you look at the history, you can understand that these people are not morally righteous. But the Muslim, because we believe in that issue, and I went to the convention before I really realized what was going on. I went to the ISNA convention and I saw George W. Bush's uh, people with their booth. And I said, well, why are you all here? And they straight out told me, well, we can identify with you Muslims because you all believe in anti-abortion like we do. And that's how we got you all on board. Well, uh, about a few weeks later, I was downtown Islamic Center. And the flyers promoting George W. Bush were there on the counter on the show. And one of the brothers, African-American brothers, picked up the flower, uh, up the flyer, and he went ballistic. He said, what? What is wrong with you people? But this is what I'm saying. If we had been working together, we would have let them know that these people are not true to the cause that they say that they believe in, that you believe in. They're snookering you into supporting them. And we all know what happened in 2000. It was Bush v. Gore, and it was, had to be decided by the Supreme Court. Well, that Muslim support actually pushed him over the line. So this is the result or the consequence of us not working together. For sure, if we had been at the table making those decisions, the Muslim community would not have supported George W. Bush for president and pushed him over the line. So it's issues like that that we need to really have the benefit of the people on the ground who've been here all this time. We know how these people are. We know how deceitful they are. And I'm not talking about all of them, but just enough of them who are using us. So they co-opt us 
So we have to be, as the sister pointed out earlier, when Sister Mokita was talking about how easily it is to be co-opted. We have to be aware of these tricks. So we've been aware of these tricks for a long time ago because back in the 60s and so forth, we, we had a phrase called, they use technology on us. So these kind of things, mm -hmm. if we had been working together, that may have been, you know, nipped in the bud. Yeah, yeah. I remember that because that was my, the first election that I was old enough to vote in. And I was in college and that conversation, I, I say some, I think one of our younger uh, sisters here said, oh, I didn't know about the endorsement of George uh, W. Bush. Uh, I remember that so well because that election almost tore apart our MSA, right? Our African-American, um, particularly African-American sister from the South, who's a daughter of an imam, you know, was she didn't quite go ballistic, but she was very upset and she was very clear about why uh, it is that the Muslim community should not, you know, um, swallow the line that the GOP was offering hook, line, and sinker on their quote unquote family values because, uh, because of the experience, <laughs> the history of, of that party in the US. Um, so, subhanAllah, I mean, I think it's really. What we've, what I think what we've been hearing throughout our conversation today is the importance, just the critical importance at this time, in this moment, to share our stories with each other and also to be open to uh, listening, to open, open to listening to things that sometimes might be harsh. Like, like Dr. Akhtar said, you know, when uh, in his article, I don't know if I had um, put the full quote up, but he had said, you know, um, he sometimes himself, you know, somebody had told him, oh, you act like an honorary white person, but they didn't mean it in a good way. And he felt stunned by that, right? So sometimes when we hear harsh truths, they're harsh and they hurt us. But we have to be, yeah. open. We have to be right. open to hearing that. Like we know that fire actually, um, you know, can also purify. You know, when people talk to us harshly, sometimes we, we should learn and benefit from what they're saying. At the same time, we should also always be open to self-reflect, to ask ourselves these questions. Am I in a space of privilege right here? Even if maybe in other aspects of my life, I don't have a space of privilege. Um, and how can I then use my privilege to help uh, or to benefit the people around me? Um, can I ask, uh, just, we have like five more minutes left and what I want to- Can I just complete my point about the- Oh, uh, oh yes, I'm so sorry, I interrupted yeah, Just you. real quick, this one, yeah. because I have so much positive experience in terms of the Muslim community, in terms of being embraced and I embrace others uh, across ethnic, uh, across uh, all kind of lines. However, there have been experiences that I have just kind of taken the hit, so to speak, and play the peacemaker because I figure that I want for my brother what I want for myself. If I feel that I've been slighted many times, it's a teachable moment. So I say, well, this brother actually needs my help. So I didn't really just go off on him. I said, well, next time I see this brother, I'll offer him some love because he did not receive me very well. But just within the last, about a year, a little over a year ago, again, downtown Islamic Center, I would go there on Fridays because I was babysitting for one of my daughters who lives in the South Loop. So I would be able to go to Juma. Mm -hmm. Anyway, I was in a hurry this particular day to get back to my babysitting assignment. And just so happens, DIC was having their particular fundraiser that day because they allow other organizations to come to DIC to fundraise. Well, this time it was DIC's turn. Mm -hmm. So I ran into the executive director. He asked me to help out to collect money after the Juma. Although I was in a hurry, I agreed because I was happy to help. But anyway, I helped by collecting a lot of money standing by the elevator. And when it was time, when I finished, I was really gonna go and catch the bus, go right back down State Street, get back within five minutes. Well, lo and behold, I have issues with my legs, so it was hard for me to walk downstairs. Oh no. So I was gonna catch the elevator, and I know it's usually crowded. So what happened was the elevator stopped. I said, oh, praise be to Allah. The elevator stopped on the way down. There was room for about three or four people to get on. And as I stepped, proceeded to step into the elevator, a brother stuck his hand out and said, no, sisters only. Oh. Well, there were like maybe about seven sisters on the elevator, but there was a brother on the elevator. Mm. And the brother was down the elevator. I said, well, no, there's a brother on here. And I said, why are you telling me sisters only? I, I'm in a hurry. Yeah. And I, have a, I have some issues with my legs. I need to go right now. He said, no, sisters only. I said, don't you see that brother there? So, I mean, my voice 
I didn't want to raise my voice, but he raised his voice and he assaulted me. He stuck his hand and pushed me back. And I was about to respond, but I had to catch myself. And this happened within the last couple of years, only oh about a year and a half ago. But all he's saying is sharing this, that some people, and I know that he treated me like that because he didn't see me as a first class Muslim. I had on my straw hat, like mm -hmm. a fedora with the brim, and I didn't look Muslim enough, I guess. Mm. So, and he didn't know who mm -hmm. I was. Mm -hmm. And I've had issues where people said that, well, I had known you were Muslim, I wouldn't have done that. When I talk to merchants sometimes. But I just want to share that because that's an anecdote that we still have a ways to go. And I know that I'm well received. In so many cases, people really have treated me so warmly, but there are those incidents, like the one I just shared. Yeah, yeah. Still happening. Mm. That, I mean, this is, it's, it's so disgusting. And I'm, I wrote in the chat that I'm, I'm boiling over in anger um, at what happened to you. Uh, because because I can see it and that somebody else might hear the story and they'll think oh maybe he's being sensitive no it's it's not it's it's not like a, some kind of a sensitive thing and 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 we're looking uh, for places where we feel aggress but this is actually an aggression and um, subhanallah like I think we we all need to be aware of when we have privilege and when we don't in what what positions that we hold in, in specific uh, in specific spaces. The other thing I wanted to comment here also is um, it's important to know when to call out and when to call in. And so what I mean by that is when you call out something, you call out a bad action, you call out maybe even a bad actor, somebody who will never change because their whole reason of existing is to harm other people. You call that out. Right, but we also have to have the wisdom to know when we can call in. So that could be, you know, maybe uh, somebody in the mosque who says something. Maybe it's a racial slur, and they don't realize it's a racial slur, or maybe they say some kind of a, a stereotype, and they don't understand what the what the history of that stereotype is. We should also have the wisdom to think about when should we call this person in. We don't always have to call people out and embarrass them and, and hurt their feelings in order to teach them. Um, we can call them in and, and, and tell them very firmly, uh, you know, why what they said or what they did was, was harmful. Ask them to redress the situation, to apologize to the person that they harmed, and then to also to commit to changing and to being better um, and, and to learning about how they can be a better ally to that person or that group of, the group of people. So I think um, I think it's really important for you know a lot of us so who, people who consider themselves to be activists. We sometimes fall into this pit of cancel culture and canceling people and calling out people. Um, and I think the wisdom here isn't to say we shouldn't call out. Anyone. The wisdom here is to know we should call them in first. And uh, there's a question that said, by calling them in, do you mean addressing them in private first? Yeah, I mean, it could be both. It could be done privately. So you can privately ask somebody, oh, hey, can I speak with you? Um, and privately tell them, you know, I observed such and such thing that you did, or somebody told me about something that happened to them. Um, and, you know, you explain to them privately, kindly about why what they did or said was was so harmful and, and give them space to uh, acknowledge that and to redress it or you could um, do it kind of generally so like for example if you're an imam or a khatib and you have access to to the mimbar you can say oh you know generalize it you know people i have been hearing people in this community use the a word or use the k word um, to describe african-american brothers and sisters and we know what the origin of the K word and the A word is in Arabic and Urdu. And Islam is against racism because of X, Y, Z. And give examples and just kind of generally say that. And then say very kindly, you know, now, you know, yesterday, maybe you didn't know about that. But today, now that we know, let's hold ourselves to a better standard. So you're not calling out the person who did it. You're calling out the action. Um, and, um, and then you're calling in the people, whether privately or, uh, or, or publicly without embarrassing them or without naming and shaming them, for example. So I wanted to um, not take up too much time or two minutes uh, past our time here, but I wanted to, um, I'm leaving up 
the a uh, couple of resources. Somebody asked earlier about where I got the, the graphic, uh, the, the data, um, and it is also a moment of time for all of us here in the Chicagoland area anyway. Um, and, but here, just very quickly, we have uh, three websites that I think will be really helpful for everyone. ISPU.org, which I had already mentioned several times. Muslimark.org, which is the organization that Marguerite Hill um, is co-founder and executive director of. And then also Sapelo Square, S-A-P-E-L-O-S-Q-U-A-R-E, sapelosquare.org. That is a webzine, an online web, uh, a, like an online magazine um, of and by and about uh, African-American uh, Islams in this country, in this land. And that's a wonderful resource. It's a great place to, to start to learn if, if you're in the position of learning or if you want to write to them, I'm sure that you would be happy to hear from, from, from folks. So I think, um, Sister Upshin, you've raised your hand. You wanted to share a final thought? Um, I, I don't think we have enough time now, but it was just a quick um, comment that I wanted to say that if we would love for you to give some basic takeaway pointers for us and our youth to be more, how to be more tolerant and respectful to all the diversity or the races that we you know, encounter in our masjid from time to time. Mm -hmm. But I don't know how much time we have for that. Probably for next time, I guess. <laughs> yeah, um, it, it could be for next time, but also uh, as, as the, especially the youth who are doing the community service project, um, I think most of you um, are still on and watching. Uh, I think as you go ahead and you do the community service project, I would recommend that you get to know people, um, other young people from different backgrounds. And, uh, you know, say, okay, instead of saying you and your friend are going to, um, you know, drive to Costco and pick something up, say, you know what, me and somebody who I don't know in the youth committee will go drive to Costco and pick something up. And then during that time, have a conversation with each other. Um, these conversations actually require uh, trust. They require trust and, and trust requires time. Um, they require people to be open with each other. And I think for young people, um, I think um, as you continue to do your work, I'm sure that I, I know that there's a WhatsApp group, I'm on it. Um, but it, you know, for other groups, as you work together, you can maybe even lay down um, some ground rules, right? Like, uh, for example, use I statements and not like you statements. Right, so don't so say I do this or I feel this way, not oh you people, you South Asians, you Arabs, you African Americans, you do that. Um, so lay down some ground rules on on how the conversation should be. That should be something that everyone agrees to, and that and, and everyone adheres to as you do your work. And um, to really think about uh, the all the logistical stuff that is needed when you do the volunteering. Think about who you're doing that work with. Um, it's not again try to expand because the point of the service learning aspect of this project is to learn something new about the people you're serving with right and so think about that think about your points of privilege that could be a prompt to have a conversation after you do the actual service i would recommend to have a debrief uh, either you can do it together on your own or, or you can ask um, you know brother imam charles or sister sarwat to help facilitate that um, and I also know that um, after your project is over, I'm going to come back, inshallah, perhaps in person, <laughs> perhaps we'll be at the parking lot of the masjid, um, and we will also continue to, de to debrief the actual event and debrief the relationship building that has been created, inshallah. So I don't know if that's uh, exactly what you uh, had asked uh, for um, and if, th if that's helpful at all. Exactly. Jazakallah khair and thank you. This is exactly one, what I wanted to hear. You're welcome. Alhamdulillah. So can I ask um, maybe Sister Sarwaj or Brother Ahmad or, or somebody to close us out with a dua? Uh, Assalamu alaikum. So uh, Sheikh Sayyid, inshallah, we'll, uh, we'll do our dua. I just wanted to thank everyone who joined today. Thank you so much for taking their time out, two hours, to come and join this important conversation. I want to remind you that this is the beginning of the conversation um, and that it doesn't end once this turns off. Uh, we'd like for you to continue to have these conversations in your homes, with your, first of all, with yourself, um, with your heart, 
um, just as we Muslims always are told to reflect upon what we read and we learn is from Islam. Um, the t speak to your children, speak to your spouses, speak to your, uh, to your extended family. When you hear something that you know is wrong, is racist, or is a microaggression against another community member who is different, speak to that person say hey you know maybe we don't want to do that we are you know in the manner the sister hint already told us um so all of this stuff um alhamdulillah you know this is really like i said it's the beginning of the conversation we want to continue this um those of you who are not in our area continue this in your masajid um muslimarc.org um is an uh, organization that will bring speakers to your masjid um so please join that um support them Support, uh, uh, support those types of organizations and have them be speakers. Have uh, for the, the, the masjid leaders who are here, um, or if you know other masjid, masjid leaders, Alhamdulillah, are uh, at Alexa, we've been actually having um, khutbas by our African American uh, Muslim brothers. Um, so that's one thing we don't really see that a lot in a lot of our masajids. So those are all things that we can do. But um, I did want to <laughs> just go back to the service part of it. Um, we inshallah will be working on um, uh, putting together toiletry kits for the homeless in, uh, in, a, from a, in a local shelter as well as doing a food, a mobile food pantry on July 29th at inshallah the first time um, may Allah make it easy at Al-Aqsa's site um, we uh, encourage all of you if you can go to plainfieldmasjid.com on the home page there should be two tabs to um, uh, donate to both of those so that we can go ahead and start compiling the kits and then start preparing for our food pantry inshallah um, and inshallah the recorded I believe session this one should be on Facebook live um, I'm hoping we can also get it on our website so if you if you know someone who wasn't able to join and wants to you know take a look um, have them join it, inshallah uh, and on the, uh, I know we're running out of time so Sheikh uh, Zaid inshallah if you can please close us out with a dua I think Brother Charles um, still has his hand up. Uh, I don't know if he wants to make a last comment. Uh, feel free to do so, inshallah. Uh, no. Okay. Thank you. So, uh, first of all, I want to thank uh, specifically uh, Brother Charles and Sister Hind uh, for giving us not only uh, time, but also their knowledge and uh, specifically uh, brother charles um your extensive knowledge and your experiences that you have been able to share with us um that we have been able to learn from as uh, sister sarwath mentioned and i had mentioned also in the very beginning that this is the first step of many that we hope to take inshallah as a community um, it is a commitment that we all have to make uh, to educate ourselves, uh, to educate our own of the systematic racism, oppression uh, that happens to many communities, specifically the African-American uh, community in this country. And what we as uh, Muslims are supposed to do and uh, how we are able to participate, uh, inshallah, in uh, forging a better path forward uh, for our communities and our country. So I thank everybody again uh, for giving us time and uh, specifically to the organizer, Sister Sarwats, JazakAllah um, for organizing this and allowing us to come together. We hoped, inshallah, that this would have been at the masjid, but because of COVID, uh, we had to keep it on Zoom. Uh, inshallah, down the line, uh, Sister Hen, Brother Charles, hopefully we'll be able to have a part two at the masjid, um, you know, physically where we are able to see each other and speak with each other. Um, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give all of us tawfiq. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give all of us the ability to truly uh, preach, practice, and live uh, the words of the Quran, the words of our Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guide, bless, and protect us all protect our communities, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us the ability to truly uh, live Islam and not just uh, preach uh, the words of our religion. Uh, Jazakallah for anybody who joined in.
the live, um, the Facebook live video will be on our Facebook page, inshallah. The recording will be uploaded on our Masjid's uh, YouTube channel, and hopefully the link will also be put on, um, on our website. Uh, again, Jazakallah for anybody who tuned in. Uh, please keep uh, posted about the service project, inshallah, that we will be doing on July 29th. And uh, we will also be posting a date for uh, when we are able to come together and put together uh, kits for the homeless shelter. I hope everybody will, uh, will be able to participate in those as well. Jazakallah again. Subhanallah wa bihamdihi. Subhanakallah wa bihamdik. Ashadu wa la ilaha illallah. Safiru kutfu ilayk. Wal asr inna al-insana la fi khusr. Illa al-ladhina amanu wa amilu salihati wa tawasabi al-haq wa tawasabi al-sabi. Jazakallah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.